So yesterday I finished up with talking about proton decay and the standard model, or as an addition to the standard model, basically an operator with three quarks and a lepton and one over some scales squared. And we found that for proton decay, kind of the 34 years or so, implied that lambda was bigger than something like 10 to the 15 GeV. So I just want to tell you a, um, an application of this, um, which is something I worked on when I was a beginning assistant professor. At this time, the SSC was being built. That was an accelerator that was supposed to be bigger than, more powerful than LHC became, but it was canceled in the end. But at that time, it was ramping up and um, there was a lot of money there, with, including a small pot for theorists. And as a beginning assistant professor, I wanted to have some of that so I could fund a postdoc. So, um, so I swore that my next paper would have, the would have SSC in the title, no matter what it was about. So what was it about? Um, one thing that we know is that, uh, you know, the, in the standard model, both the, the W and the Z get mass from the Higgs. That happens automatically whenever the Higgs gets a VEV because the Higgs has to carry, the Higgs carries the gauge interactions. Um, and then the fermions, it does double duty though. The fermions also get a mass from the Higgs and uh, uh, through Yukawa couplings. So, but what if it wasn't a Higgs? Or what if um, we had a theory like what's called technicolor, where instead of a scalar particle, you have quarks, uh, you have some uh, fermions, not quarks, some fermions condensing in the vacuum that break the symmetry. How would you give mass to the, to the uh, fermions that way, our normal quarks and leptons? It's always interesting to try to think about how mass could be generated and to see if there are other ways of doing it. So that's what I was thinking about. And so I asked myself, well, what would happen in the standard model if um, uh, the Higgs, which of course had not been discovered at that time, this is the early 90, suppose the Higgs only couples to the W and Z. <coughs> or no Higgs. What happens? Well, if you just have the standard model with SU2 cross, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, people had already answered this question. If there's no Higgs, you still find that QCD gets strong. And you end up with, um, in the vacuum, you end up with a non-trivial quark condensate, just like in superconductivity some scale which is not zero. And this involves a, a connection between left and right-handed quarks. Um, and since the left carry electroweak quantum numbers, they're doublets under SU2 and the rights are singlets, this breaks the weak interactions. And so this will give you a W mass. Um, it's way too small. It's about a factor of 100 too small. You'd end up with a W mass on the order of uh, something like 800 MeV. No surprise, it'd be around a QCD scale. But that got people excited and they said, well, maybe we could have a new version of QCD that gets strong, not at, you know, at a scale 100 times higher. And that would explain where the W and the Z masses came from. And that's the theory of Technicolor, which was a very interesting and viable theory until they discovered the Higgs and they did not discover the uh, radiative corrections they expected for the W and Z mass. But this by itself does not give mass to quarks and leptons because these uh, technic quarks uh, would couple to the W and Z because they carry gauge interactions, but there's no reason once you have these new types of quarks which get um, a VEV on the order of um, say 250 Jev, sorry, cubed. There's no reason for these to couple to our ordinary quarks and leptons. So then what my question would then to myself was, okay, uh, what happens if this theory, even though it doesn't have a Higgs, does have a proton decay operator? 
In other words, there's an SU5 or some grand unified theory above it. Well, yesterday I said that, you know, you could say that this composite operator could look like uh, Z1 times a proton plus Z2 times a proton pi zero plus neutron pi plus plus dot dot dot, where here I'm assuming that this is uh, charge plus one. You could also make combinations of quarks which are charge minus one. Um, and we focused on this because then QQQL could give you P goes to E plus pi zero. But what happens if we look at this part instead? Well then, QQQL, one over lambda squared, uh, goes to Z1 over lambda squared times P E plus when you, sorry, E minus, when you look at the, uh, some particular SU2 combination of it. So this looks like mass mixing between um, the proton and the positron. But that's sort of weird, but this operator violates very number of lepton numbers, so that's allowed. So let's look at the mass matrix. Looks at, um, for the proton and the positron. So in terms of fields, that'd be uh, P bar, E bar, and then we have a mass matrix, and then P and E. So the proton gets most of its mass, not from the Higgs, but from QCD. Okay, only a small part of the proton mass is, can be attributed to the Higgs. Almost all of it comes from the chiral symmetry breaking. And so in this corner here, the the, the proton mass is pretty much the same as it always has been. Okay, and the electron mass, because there's no Higgs, you can't write down electron mass term in your Lagrangian, which is SU2 cross U1 invariant, so you get a zero here. But now we have this mixing in the off-diagonal part. Now Z1, by dimensions, these all have to have dimensions of mass. So Z1 is this factor that uh, converts three quark fields, which have dimension uh, nine halves, to a proton field, which has dimension three halves, so this must have dimension six halves or three, goes like mass cubed, and it comes from QCD, where QCD is bound these three quarks up into protons, so Z1 goes like lambda QCD cubed. And I'm gonna assume that this is much, much less than the grand unified scale, which is this lambda. So this would be, uh, say, 10 to the 15 Jev, and this would be one Jev cubed. So. so it's easy to write down what the eigenvalues of this matrix then are. Uh, so you get the eigenvalues. Are, well, and proton and uh, lambda QCD to the six over uh, M proton lambda squared, uh, lambda fourth. And so this is the proton mass, mostly, and this is the electron mass. So in fact, even though the electron hasn't coupled to a Higgs boson, it still feels SU2 cross U1 breaking through this proton decay operator. So it's a combination of QCD and grand unification that gives the electron a mass. It's, how big is it? Well, if I put in these types of numbers, um, well, I guess I use 10 to the 16 Jev here, you find that the electron mass has 
the remarkable value of 10 to the minus 64, Jeff. <laughs> okay, so its Compton wavelength is vastly bigger than the known universe. That's not interesting, but what is interesting is that we have a new mechanism for giving a particle a mass. We've let it uh, mix with a composite state. So this mechanism then could be also ramped up just like Technicolor was to some higher scale. You have new, a new QCD uh, and you couple not to quarks, but these uh, Techniquarks up here or something like that. And it gives you a new mechanism for maybe giving mass. And so this is a mechanism called partial compositeness. Um, and the paper I wrote, which is called Flavor uh, at SSC Energies, which got me $35,000, uh, uh, it was, had a flavor model which is completely forgettable, but it had this mechanism, and this mechanism then has been repurposed in other model buildings since then. And it's sort of an interesting application of, of effective field theory. Um, so I wanted to just show it to you because um, it's not, Effective field theory is not all about just looking for small effects at low energy. It can also, you know, inspire uh, new types of theories that you could think about. Yeah. What is the representation of the lepton field in the or in the, in the operator? So, sorry, what? What is the representation? Oh yeah. Of the so the lepton, I, I wrote it generically. It could be the right-handed electron. It could be the lepton doublet. It, there are many different ways of contracting the SU2 indices in these types of operators and flavor as well. So I was just being generic here. And does it happen for a specific, for either only the left-handed one or the right-handed one? No, I don't think it does. I think the, the, the left-handed positron can mix with the left-handed, with the right-handed proton and the cool. right-handed electron can mix with the left-handed proton. Okay, I'm gonna, are there any questions? I'm going to um, leave the topic of effective field theory for beyond the standard model physics and show you applications of quantum field theory in a completely different realm. So if there are any questions on this so far, please let me know or ask me at lunch. Okay, so I mentioned yesterday that we can, we can do all sorts of incredible physics the way Fermi did just by doing dimensional analysis without doing really complicated calculations. And to illustrate that, um, I'm gonna talk about the question which is why is the sky blue? So when you look out there and the sky is blue, uh, the reason why you see light there is because light has come from the sun and not to your eye, but to some atoms in the, in the atmosphere and then have bounced to your eye from there. And for some reason it's bouncing blue light more than red light. And so the, the light has been shifted. It doesn't look like the same color as when I uh, look at the sun. So it becomes a question is, uh, why does uh, blue light scatter off atoms more than red light. And of course, in the atmosphere, the atoms are electrically neutral, usually. So we have to think about how we would describe light scattering off a neutral object. It's easy to imagine how it scatters off a charged object. Uh, We draw a picture like that, and it comes from uh, psi bar i capital D slash psi, where this is the covariant derivative, and this is the photon field. But we can't draw a diagram like that if, if we're trying to scatter off a neutral atom. So, How are we going to describe a neutral atom? And how does the photon couple to it? Sure. 
So let's start with the neutral atom. So we have some atom here, and it's moving along. It has some mass m, which is uh, many GeV in energy, that, because it has many nucleons in it. Maybe it's CO2 or something like that, so it's got something like, I don't know, I shouldn't have said CO2, uh, 40, say. <laughs> I don't know how many nucleons CO2 has. But anyway, it's, it's big, and the light that's coming in is visible, so it's on the order of EV. So the atom's not going to know it's been hit by the photon. It's just going to keep moving along as if nothing happened, okay? So this scale here, m, is not going to matter in our problem. You could set it to infinity, and it wouldn't make any difference. I mean, it's like you're throwing ping pong balls off a truck as it goes by. You want to know how they bounce. And your student says, excuse me, how much does the truck weigh? And you'd say, you don't need to know that to answer this problem. Neutrino scattering. I'm sorry? That's how they measure coherent neutrino scattering. Oh, okay. Well, some people are interested. <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> okay. So, so this thing is barreling along, and I'm going to give it a four velocity, B mu. Where V mu, V mu is one. So, um, and so then it's, um, the four velocity is not going to change. So I'm going to invent a field, phi V, which uh, creates or destroys atom with velocity V mu. And I'll want to sum up over all possible Vs in my Lagrangian because all possible velocities of atoms could be affected by the light, but the the photon coupling will not couple one V to another V because it can't change the velocity of the atom to first approximation. Now, this is non-relativistic. But I'm using a relativistic notation because it's simpler because I'm going to talk about photons, and photons naturally are described in relativistic notation in terms of an A mu. So we'll have, we're going to use this to, uh, to make it clear that this is non-relativistic in the long run. But to start with, I want to, have, I want to express a Lagrangian that has uh, this sort of dispersion relation. But of course, this is not the whole momentum because there should be a plus mc squared, or I set c to 1. So I don't want that there. We're doing non-relativistic physics. I don't want to lug around the rest mass energy. It's completely unimportant. It's big, but it's unimportant. Uh, so I'm going to um, write down a Lagrangian, which just pays attention to the kinetic term. So I'm going to write down the Lagrangian equals sum on all possible velocities of phi v dagger I d by dt uh, plus uh, del squared over 2m by v. And so the time dependence of this field, basically the e to the minus i m t has been removed. Just like we don't include it when we do the Schrodinger equation. When we talk about a particle, we never put in the rest mass energy. So in a sense, the, this time dependence, which never changes because we can't change the mass in non-relativistic physics, just goes along for the ride and we just get rid of it. So we, this we write down, this is our dispersion relation and drop the rest mass energy. So we, here is a Lagrangian to describe this field. And it gives you the right low energy kinetic energy, uh, the right kinetic energy, in other words, the Schrodinger equation. 
But now I want to couple this to photons. Since phi is neutral, we cannot promote uh, d mu to d mu plus i e a mu because the charge is zero. <laughs> so we can't put the photon where we normally put it. So how do I couple the photon? I'm constrained by gauge invariance. This was the constraint, you know, this is how I had to do it when the particle was charged to maintain gauge invariance. Now phi doesn't transform under the gauge transformation, so whatever I couple to has to be made out of photons and has to be gauge invariant all by itself. Have we seen anything we can make out of photons that's gauge invariant? Correct answer is yes. <laughs> F mu nu. When you have a mu goes to a mu plus d mu times some lambda of x, then uh, the two pieces involving lambda of x cancel because one's d mu d nu and the other one's minus d nu d mu and the derivatives the, don't care what order they're in, so the lambda drops out, and this is gauge invariant. So, a good guess then is that we couple phi, some phi dagger phi operator, has to couple to F mu nu. I'm going to drop the V because it looks too much like new, and I'm not ever changing V. You just have to remember it's there. Now, so I want a couple phi dagger phi to F. So you see there are no indices there. F has two indices. The Lagrange has got to be Lorentz invariant. How do I saturate indices? Yeah? You can contract F mu nu with itself. Say, say it again? You can contract F mu nu with itself. Good. So I need two F mu. Oh, you mean uh, F, F mu mu? Uh, no, uh, F mu F mu are both raised. Good. Two Fs. This is zero because it's an anti symmetric tensor, but I could use phi dagger phi F mu nu F mu nu. That's one operator. I want another one with two Fs. Say it again? Yes, I could do derivatives. I could do, uh, say, uh, phi dagger uh, yeah, I could do something like uh, maybe d alpha d beta phi f alpha mu f beta mu, something like that. But what do I know about this operator relative to that operator? Order. Say it again? Higher order. Yeah, this is higher order. This is higher dimension, which means more irrelevant. which is equal to less important for low energy. So I claim there's another operator that will come at the same order as this. And I'm not allowed to use derivatives because derivatives take me to higher order. Is there any other four vector in this problem? that I could contract with the indices. B. 
contract amium? Say what? Could you contract amium with them? Or like two, like, 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 like amu, anu, fmu? So I can't use other amus because then it wouldn't be gauge invariant. So fmu is the only gauge invariant object I could use to made out of s. But it's a good try. It's on the board. <laughs> Beam you. So I could also write something that looks like phi dagger phi, and then I could do a V alpha V beta. I can't contract that with F alpha beta because F alpha beta is anti-symmetric in alpha beta and V alpha and V beta are just numbers that would commute. But I can do it like this. And since V is a velocity and I'm still working on units where I set C to one, even though this isn't relativistic for the atom, it is for the photon. So all velocities are dimensionless in my counting. So this has the same dimension as that. <coughs> so what I've got here is some sort of interesting vertex where I've got two photons coming in. And you know that what's probably happened is if I look at this closely, is that a photon has come in and it's excited the atom to some excited state, and then it's de-excited and spat it out again. But I'm looking, I'm, I'm contracting that to a point, so it looks like a contact interaction. That's effective field theory for you. You don't have to know about the structure of the atoms. You just have to know the coefficients of these two operators. So all of the complexity of these atom molecules, whatever, yeah, maybe this is a vibrational state of a, of a molecule or something like that. So the complexity gets contracted down to a point and there are just two operators I can write down. This exhausts the ones at this dimension. So there are two numbers I need to fit experimentally. I can do this in the lab. I can see how photons scatter off neutral atoms and then I can go study this theory and see if, what it tells me about light from the atmosphere. So this is called the polarizability of the atom. Basically, atoms are squishy, so if you put it in an electric or magnetic field, the charge is inside uh, just to it, and that gives you an interaction between the electromagnetic field and the atom. And there are two types of polarizability. There's electric polarizability and the magnetic polarizability. So there can't have been just one operator. There has to be two, because there are two parameters I can measure for the atom. So now, to understand, how scattering depends on the energy of the photon, I just have to do some dimension counting and figure out how many powers of energy come into the cross section. So, we know that we have our, our action is dt d3x times by dagger dt, idt plus del squared over 2m times phi. That's our kinetic term. So um, the first thing we notice, let's see. So if I just do the usual mass dimension thing, then this has mass dimension one. because d by dt is mass dimension one, del squared is the mass dimension two, but I'm dividing it by the atom mass. This is mass dimension four, minus four, I mean. So just like for a uh, fermion in a relativistic theory, phi dagger phi must have dimension three, phi is dimension three halves, This is familiar from quantum mechanics. When you integrate psi star psi d3x, you get one, which is dimensionless. So psi star psi must have dimension three. So this is the same sort of dimension counting you'd use for a quantum, non-relativistic quantum wave function. So now, what about photons? Well, we know that for the electron, for example, the photon can come in like this, where this is, dimensionless, this has dimension one, and so 
The photon must also have dimension one. F mu nu is d mu a nu times d mu a mu. And so F has a photon field, which is dimension one, and a derivative, which is dimension one, so it has dimension two. My four velocity has dimension zero. You can write this as dx alpha d tau, where tau is the proper time, so there's a, a space divided by a time, so that's dimensionless. And then we just need to find out the dimension of our operators, and so we can write down site C1 phi dagger phi f mu nu f mu nu plus C2 phi dagger phi v alpha v beta f alpha mu f beta mu. This has dimension three. This has dimension four. Three. Four. This has to have dimension four because we're in four dimensions. And so we see that um, C1 and C2 have the same dimension. They are at the same order and they're dimension minus three. So they go like length squared. So what length might that be? I'm going to be very crude to my estimate here, but the important thing is that if you have an atom here, it looks like a ball of charge, plus charge and minus charge, but distributed unequally with the plus charge at the center, and your photon is coming in, very long wavelength photon coming in. It's going to look basically like a classical scattering event, and so you would expect that the, um, the strength of the interaction is governed by the size of the atom. Which, my purpose is, is just gonna be R naught, which is, I'm gonna just say, Bohr radius. I'm not interested in anything precise, just how things scale. So, if that's the parameter that sets all the scattering, then you might expect that C1 and C2 go like the Bohr radius cubed because I said it had to be dimension minus three. Let's just make sure that this picture is right, that the atom is small compared to the wavelength. So remember that the Bohr radius in a hydrogen atom, the Bohr radius goes like one over alpha m electron. We expect this thing to scatter because of excitations. So the photon energy must be on the order of a level spacing in an atom, but the energy spacing in an atom is, is in a hydrogen atom is set by alpha squared m electron. And so you see there is a hierarchy. This is a mass scale alpha squared me, which is down from this mass scale by a factor of alpha. So there is a hierarchy between the length of the wave and the size of the atom of order alpha. That is a key ingredient in an effective field theory. I have to look at length scales which are small or long compared to length scales which are short. So large length scale or small energy, short length scale, higher energy. So this gives you the hierarchy Namely, omega photon Q, omega photon times R naught is order alpha, which is less than one. So 
this, we are in a realm where effective filtering should work. Now all we need to say is that uh, the cross section then for atom photon goes to atom photon, goes like this Feynman diagram squared. So it's proportional to that. Or rather, it's equal to this times phase space. With, this comes about by just summing over all possible states, final states, and all possible initial states. Um, and so we find then that this goes like C i squared, where i is one or two. So C one or two squared times phase space. And this is just r naught to the six by our estimate. But what's the dimension of a cross section? Area. So we have to knock down this by four powers of length or multiply by four powers of energy to get it into the right dimensions. And that has to come from the phase space. Now remember that the atom's not doing anything. The atom's staying in the same state it came in, basically. It's the photon's phase space we're interested in. And the only scale there is the photon energy. So this is gonna have to go like omega photon to the fourth. And so what you get then is that the cross section, an estimate which goes like r naught to the six omega photon to the fourth, and this is what's called Rayleigh scattering. And it tells you that blue light, which has higher energy, um, actually looked up, is about equal to nine. So you get nine times the cross section for scattering blue light versus red light. So that's a crude description of why this guy's blue. Apparently, um, at Caltech, to be a you know, question and answer session between the professors and the student after uh, the exam or during the exam to try to see how much physics they knew. And it was well known that uh, why is the sky blue is sort of a common question. So the student comes in, Feynman asks, why is the sky blue? Guy just rattles off because Rayleigh scattering goes like energy to the fourth. And Feynman says, why are clouds gray? The student goes, <laughs> <laughs> Any question? If I may, I have one. So when you shorten the wavelength of the light, how does the breaking of EFT manifest itself? Um, well, for one thing, uh, this operator that we talked about here will not be suppressed. Um, or you could have a lower dimension operator, I believe, with one derivative and one power of V. That effect would come in at one power more of R naught in the coupling, which means the cross section would have a cross term, which is one power of R naught higher, and therefore one power of omega higher. And so uh, we'd expect an order alpha correction because omega R naught is roughly alpha. Long wavelength limit, like uh, rather than short, short wavelength, we break down. And so we just need the, the lower radius. So we call that like omega small limit. Um, yeah. Yeah. This this formula is for small omega, and the question is how high can you push it? And I say that for atomic type omegas, the your you have a good hierarchy of about alpha. This wouldn't work for X-rays. With X rays, omega is on the order of R naught, and this would completely break yeah, down. About the other, the other In the other direction, go to infrared. Uh, uh, it breaks down. It breaks down because the infrared sees the rotational excitations of the of the molecules, water molecules, for example, and get absorbed very strongly. Okay, so this idea that you're scattering off single atoms is not correct. You have much, much lower energy scales in the rotational and vibrational uh, molecular 
uh, degrees of freedom. So if you have a low enough uh, uh, photon where instead of exciting the atom, it's exciting the rotational um, states of a molecule, then in fact, you have a different scale. It's no longer R0 that sets the scale to the center. Uh, I remember once looking at the absorption coefficient for water as a function of wavelength. And I looked and said, oh my god, that's an amazing coincidence. Light, water is completely opaque, except for right in the visible range. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, that was stupid. <laughs> So, I have one question. Yeah. If you could do an experiment where you have just one atom and you don't see any rotational, but still break down in some way? I'm sorry? If you just have one atom, you can do an experiment. You, you just can you measure the atom. polarizability? Yes, you send a photon with lower and lower energy on this single atom. Would this break down some, some? I believe that Rayleigh scattering formula is going to work well yeah, for low energy yeah. scattering yeah. for a single atom. Yeah. This is outside my expertise, so um, I know, having looked at Jackson, there are all sorts of caveats and you know, complicated things that can happen. This is very, very uh, simplified version of what's going on. Yeah. So. Sorry, it's more. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I just, I'm teaching this kind of things in the ENA, and I ask also students why the sky is not fire. Um, I think it is because the absorption of wa that water absorbs violet, ultraviolet. Uh, yeah. So this velocity coupling is confusing to me. And okay, I guess I have a lot of questions, but. First one is, is this velocity relative to something? So really what this velocity is doing is reminding you that this is a non-relativistic problem. So V is only looks basically like this. To first, well, there's this very small little V there. So it's got a much bigger time component than space component. So this is actually a way of picking out the electric field and the magnetic field separately. One combination picks out the electric field, one picks out the magnetic field, and it's because it's non-relativistic, there doesn't have to be a relation on how they couple. But I, I wrote it this way, because this way, uh, if V transforms relativistically, then this is invariant, okay? Even though I really want to stay in a frame where V is exactly. in this point. Yeah, you're choosing a frame. Okay, so the next one is this very nice uh, effective field theory derivation by Paul Chimsky. Um, which is, um, um, how can, so why are certain metals superconducting? And here I'll be talking about BCS pairing. So what happens in a superconductor is in some materials, electrons moving in opposite directions head on form bound states that are on a scale much larger than the, than the atomic spacing in the material. And by having a Bose-Einstein condensate of these pairs, you get superconductivity. It's probably one of the most transformational theories of the 20th century, because it completely changed particle physics too, because the whole Higgs mechanism comes out of this theory. The understanding of pions as Goldson bosons comes out of this theory. Our understanding of confinement comes out of this theory. So let's look at uh, free electrons at low temperature. And I'm gonna look at a vastly oversimplified system where uh, the Fermi uh, surface is a sphere. So 
So what I've plotted here is in momentum space, And so all the electrons within this sphere are occupied and all the ones outside are empty. All the states are empty. Now, I want to write down a theory for, um, so most of these fermions are trapped in there. They can't really, they can't move to a nearby, nearby state because it's already occupied. So the only place where a small amount of energy can make a difference is on the surface. So, there's going to be a region on the surface, let me use a different color here, um, where interesting physics can happen if I put in interactions. So just in a small surface here, can electrons move around because they could be promoted from an occupied state to an unoccupied state with a small amount of energy. You can't move this here out there without using a huge amount of energy. So we're going to talk about an effective theory for particles that are near the surface. So that's going to play the role, the surface is going to play the role of zero energy that we've had in relativistic theories. We say we've been talking about particles with small energies, which means energy close to zero. Here we're going to talk about momenta close to the surface. So we want the effective theory near the surface. And I'm going to say that the, a state is going to have some momentum p. I'm going to exaggerate, make it look a little farther from the surface. So this is p. And I'm going to write p as two parts. I'll call the part of the vector that goes to this Fermi surface k, and the part that either extends past it or the part that uh, does not quite reach the Fermi surface as L. So L is going to be some small deviation from the Fermi surface. And we want this to be small. So L, small L is going to be low, is going to play the role of low energy for us. So this is a little bit funny. It's quite a different setup than what we had before because of the fact that in relativistic theory, this is zero. The ground state has no momentum. Here, the low, the state we're going to call uh, equivalent to the vacuum will be K equals zero, which has a surface. Now let's just try to, we'll assume particle-like excitations, which is certainly true if there's no interaction, because then they're just electrons. But we're going to assume that when you turn on interactions and you interact with the crystal substructure and everything, that the particle nature is still there. Uh, we'll call them quasi-particles. And we won't assume that they obey uh, the usual free dispersion relation. I'll try to write something more general. So um, let me write the action. And it's not convenient to do this in space, to write the, the action as an integral over space, because uh, I'm really interested in momentum space. So instead of space, I'm going to do D3P. And now I'll look at uh, operators not in space, but their Fourier transform in momentum space. And so I'll write psi dagger. And I expect um, to put in a arbitrary function of p for the energy. But I'm not interested in the total energy. I don't want to include the Fermi energy, just like in the previous problem. I didn't want to include the rest mass in my discussion because I can't change that. So what I'll write down here is instead of the energy, I'll write some function of p, which is my dispersion relation, minus the Fermi energy where the Fermi energy is the energy when p equals k. 
namely when the momentum lies on the surface, the Fermi surface. And this is a function of P. Now, there are also spin indices here, and they're important for real superconductivity, but I'm not going to clutter up my notation with spin indices. Now, we want to scale. So before, when I talked about dimension, I didn't really quite say what I meant by that. Before, we wanted m, we wanted energies and momenta to go to zero. So this is the relativistic case. And we said that these had mass dimension one. So one way to say it is that uh, we have, we replace E by R times E and P by R times P. And then we want to look at R goes to zero and mass dimension one means scales like r to the one. And mass dimension minus one means scales like r to the minus one. So if I send momentum small, the de Broglie wavelength gets large. So x scales like r inverse, p scales like r. So that's going to be how I think about uh, dimension counting is how things scale as I change the size of the thing I'm interested in, namely the energy. So here, I don't want to scale the energy. I want to scale L, how close I am to the surface. L by RL and R goes to zero. But K has to be remain fixed. It stays on the surface. So it's not the momentum that scales, it's L. It's not P. So let's expand E of P minus E F for low L. And we have that by definition E of, so this is E of P is equal to E of K plus L, because that's our definition of P. And E of K is equal to E Fermi, because K is sitting on the surface, and by definition, when you're sitting on the surface, you have the Fermi energy, EF. Every state on the surface has the same energy, the Fermi energy. In a real system, the surface is still equa energy surface, but in general it's not a sphere because the symmetries of the problem typically aren't rotationally invariant. But in this simple case, it's a sphere. Any vector that lies right on the sphere has energy EF. And so this quantity then can be written as so the gradient with respect to K of E of K dot L that's the leading order term in a Taylor expansion because the zeroth order term is zero because E of when L is zero, this vanishes. So since I'm dealing with L small, I'm going to replace this quantity for this. And this is just called the Fermi velocity. So this is just some number, some constant, it has to do with your dispersion relation. And so this is integral dt, integral d3k. So a good approximation, you're integrating over the surface of the Fermi sphere. Let me just make sure I'm not screwing up here. Sorry, so yeah, I'm screwing up. So K is a, confined to a surface, right? So it's D2K. 
and then it's DL. And then I can drop calling this a function of P, I can just call a function of L. This is I dt minus B Fermi dot L. And so we see then that, first of all, by dt, they have to scale the same way. It doesn't, theory doesn't make sense. If it is equal to d2k dl, and d2k doesn't scale at all, and dl has dimension one. If d by dt is dimension one, then dt has dimension minus one, because time is the inverse of a derivative or vice versa. And so what we see then is that this is, has dimension minus one, this has dimension one, this has dimension one. And if the action is supposed to be dimensionless because you're exponentiating it, so it shouldn't have dimension, um, then we find that um, psi dagger psi um, has dimension minus one, psi has dimension minus a half. It's weird scaling, but this is what falls, yeah. Um, I guess why we're choosing d squared k dl, because I, I recognize that obviously in a sense that dimensionally the same. Okay, so what I'm doing is I wanna, there's, think of this uh, little shell around the Fermi surface with some thickness L, DL, whatever. Yeah. And I want to sum my states in this shell. So the first thing I can do is I can sum where the, where the K is, and then I have to sum over the thickness of the shell. So D2K tells me which little uh, piece I'm interested in. So this would be this, uh, so I have a little cube of volume here. The surface here is D2K, and the length here is DL. Okay, so, so you're saying in the radial direction is DL, and then these, Sorry? you're saying in the radial direction is DL, and then say right. yeah. this so actual if surface. This is, if we're on the Earth, we can't even see the curvature. I'm talking about a slab of thickness DL, and so when I want to sum over this slab, it's really a sphere, but it looks like a slab where I'm standing. Uh, I can take a unit area times the unit thickness, and the area is D2K, and the thickness is DL. So this dimensional analysis is based on the R, right? Not the yes, it's based on scaling L by this factor R. If, if we, so L scales, the thickness can scale. If but we were to do the d squared k, like obviously we're trying to do uh, an argument there of some sort to try and get the Trying to what? Like, would we not need some type of factor there? Because as far as I can tell, k and L are in the same direction. And um, so, so would we not need another factor in there in order to spread it over the circuit? Right, so D2K really means summing up over the all possible angles, which is a two-dimensional integral, d theta d phi, and L is a length scale. So this is D2K with the constraint that it lies on the surface, it's, and this is going to be the, how thick it is. So that's what I mean by DL, okay? D2K is all possible Ks summed over, but constrained to lie on the surface. Okay. Okay, so this is sort of a boring theory. It's a free theory. Let's put in an interaction. So for example, through phonons, which are the vibrational modes of the crystal, or photons, which would be like the Coulomb interaction. with either 
lattice or the other electrons. Okay, and we're going to approximate this as a contact interaction. So I can write that as, but I'm working in momentum space. So what I'm going to write this as is I'm going to have S interaction is integral dt. And then I'm going to need to have, uh, so I want to put in a product over all three Ps. And then I have to put in a momentum conserving delta function. Because I want the momentum P1 coming in, say, and P2 coming in to equal P3 going out plus P4 going out. And that's what this does. So now I have to figure out, is this relevant? Irrelevant? Marginal? So I need to figure out the dimension. So dt has dimension. Uh, what did we say? We said it was minus one. Here we have a product of four d3ps, but we already said that d3p is really d2ki dli. And so the k's don't scale and l does. There are four of them. So this is dimension four. We have our delta th function, which we'll talk about in a moment, times c. And then we have psi dagger, psi squared. And remember psi has dimension minus a half, so this is dimension minus two. So it follows that this must have dimension minus one. But we're not quite there yet. We want to know the dimension of C. Remember, the argument is that if C has dimensions of inverse scaling, then the cross section is going to go to zero. It's going to be irrelevant because the uh, cross section is going to have to scale like, uh, like an area, which is inverse momentum squared. So we have to figure out what does this mean for C? Is it irrelevant? If this is a negative dimension, it would be irrelevant, which means that in the far infrared, all you're left with is the free theory, and it would look like a bunch of non-interacting particles. That's what is called a Landau liquid. It's not a superconductor. So if we want to describe superconductors, there must be some way that you can get C not negative. But to figure out what C is, we have to figure out what the delta function does. So the guess would be that delta three of P total could be written as delta three of K total as L goes to zero. If that's the case, then the dimension of delta three of P total is the dimension three of delta three of K total. And K does not scale, so this is zero, which implies that C equals minus one in dimension, which implies irrelevant interaction. which implies no superconductivity because it looks like a bunch of free particles. So this cannot always be true that the delta function looks like that. So let's look at it a little bit more carefully. So we want to look at the delta function of the total momentum in the limit that L goes to zero.
let's fix K1 and K2. Let's say that the incoming particles have momentum here and here. That means that delta three of P total is a constraint that says that K3 plus K4, so when L equals zero, is equal to K1 plus K2. And so, since K3 and K4 have to also be vectors lying on the sphere, you can see that it narrows it down to vectors lying on this circle. Where K3 and K4 are on opposite sides of that circle. That's any K3 and K4 that satisfies that, namely that they lie on this circle here, and with any possible orientation this way, will satisfy K3 plus K4 equals K1 plus K2. So, K3 and K4 is, are naively four degrees of freedom, but not naively, they are four degrees of freedom. And the delta function constrains three of them and leaves one undetermined, namely the orientation on the circle. That is exactly what you would expect delta three of k to do. This three tells you there are three delta functions. There are therefore three different constraints. And that is exactly what we see here. We see that this is whittling down four degrees of freedom down to one. So this makes it look like our guess that we could replace delta three of P by delta three of K looks right. But the situation is different if we happen to look at initial states that are heading right at each other. Okay, now we have the situation where we have K1 is here, K2 is there. And the delta function tells us that K3 plus K4 has to also equal zero. which is, tells me that I have to have something like that. But now the ends of the blue arrows, arrows are not restricted. I mean, they have to be opposite sides, but they could be anywhere on the sphere. And it would still satisfy the constraint as long as they're back to back. So this takes four degrees of freedom to two, so it's only two constraints. But delta three of P is three constraints. So this requires some thought, but I'm gonna claim that this is equal to delta two of K delta of L. If you have three constraints, 
and only two of them are used on the Ks, the third one has to be used on the L. So I encourage you to think about that. I'm gonna take it for the truth here. It's a subtle argument. What happens then if delta three of P total is equal to delta two of K total, delta of L total, then the scaling dimension is equal to minus one because since an integral dl delta of l equals one, if this is dimension one, this is dimension minus one. Delta functions go like inverse of the argument. So if you go back to here, if the delta function is scale minus one, that implies that c is marginal just like in QCD. It has no dimension. So what happens with marginal operators is you need to go to a quantum correction to see whether it gets pushed in the relevant or the irrelevant direction. And what you find is, so this is the graph you'd compute to compute the beta function for C, and the question is, is it positive or negative? If it is negative, then it's like QCD, asymptotically free. Like QCD. And if, it's, if it has a positive beta function, it's irrelevant, and that's like uh, a, what we call a trivial theory, like QED. <laughs> Where by QED, I mean QED all by itself in a world with no other physics. We found that it had a Landau pole and therefore in the infrared, there could be no interactions. So which is it? Well, you find that this is what happens if C is attractive. If the net four fermion interaction is attractive, it's relevant. And if it's repulsive, it's irrelevant. And in different materials, it's, some of it's attractive, some is repulsive. It has to do with how the, the Coulomb repulsion between electrons is counteracted by phonon attraction. And so in theories where there's an attraction at short distance, you become, you get a relevant operator, C gets stronger and stronger in the infrared, and then the theory becomes non-perturbative, just like QCD. But in QCD, when it becomes non-perturbative, quark and antiquark condense out of the vacuum. And so similarly here, you'll find these particle anti these particle hole pairs are gonna, or these, sorry, these quasi-particles are gonna condense and make Cooper pairs. And while this doesn't show how that happens, it shows that if it happens, it'll be because C becomes strong. And furthermore, just like in QCD, where it gets strong is asymptotically lower energy of exponentially lower energy than the scale of the lattice, which means that these Cooper pairs will be really big, just like hadrons are really big compared to the Planck scale. This is like an effective, I guess, confinement of sorts, like... Sorry, what? You're saying that this is like effectively mimicking confinement quarks, but putting them in Cooper pairs in the lattice? Yeah, it's own, but historically it's not the direction. The particle physicists saw that and say, oh my god, that's what quarks are doing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to tell you, yeah. Can I ask then, because, you know, when quarks turn into hadrons, you know, 
hadrons themselves, they're still non-bosonic, but Cooper pairs behave yeah, so like a, a bosonic the, the, the hadrons are not the analog of the Cooper pairs. What happens is that QCD, you have something called chiral symmetry breaking, where Q bar Q in the vacuum is non-zero. I mentioned that a little bit earlier today. The vacuum of QCD is not empty the way it would be in QED. I mean, with fluctuations, but basically empty. You find that it is completely full of quark and quark pairs. And the reason why you know this is that this breaks some of the global symmetries of QCD and therefore produces something called Goldson bosons. And the pions are the Goldson bosons for this. Okay, okay so you're saying it's better to compare this to Right, so the hadrons are bound states of the quasi-particles above this background. And I don't know of any analog in superconductivity, but this condensate is like the condensate, the bosons and condensate okay. of the yeah. So for this configuration, it's more generic, right? Like, uh, because it doesn't specify like K plus one, uh, K, plus, K one plus K is equal to zero. So, but the, this configuration is not important because it's, it turns out to be irrelevant, right? Okay, the coefficient. And then, like, then we have to look at this specific configuration it picks up marginal or eventually maybe relevant. Okay? We need to know whether it's going to be superconductor or not? Or? Uh, I mean, like, uh, so, because this has a more phase, larger phase space, like this configuration, but we don't care because it's coefficient is the right number. But do I understand correctly? Or? I think, if I understand correctly, oh, I, yes. I think I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a very particular construct. Yeah, so um, I heard a nice explanation for why it is that opposite. You'd think that things going opposite each other wouldn't attract. You'd think it would be the ones that sort of go along next to each other would, would attract. But remember, these are electrons. The ones that go next to each other see the Coulomb repulsion. They're not attracted to each other. But I heard this nice explanation of, by Weisskopf for what is going on. If you have an electron going through the lattice, it attracts the, the nuclei in the crystal and makes them contract a little bit. They want to get closer to the electron. And so you see this channel where the crystal is a little bit more positively charged. And so a particle going the other way has a much easier time. It likes, it likes being there. And so you get correlations between a particle going this way and a particle going that way because they both like to see the, the uh, lattice deform to make a little positive channel. So lattice deformations are what phonons are. So this is the phonon attraction between particles going in opposite directions. Anyway, I, I just want to now tell you a cautionary tale that I keep in my head all the time as I get older and older, uh, which is, was told to me by uh, Tom Applequist, who was a, an assistant professor at Harvard in the early 70s. And he and a postdoc named Carazon wanted to decide, see whether um, QCD was, or non abelian gauge theories were relevant or irrelevant. So they decided they had to compute the beta function. The beta function for QCD involves a lot of different diagrams. It was in the early days when the whole machinery for computing and yang mills series was new and confusing and complicated. And uh, Applequist said they got about 50 pages into the calculation and they said, oh, this answer is gonna be depend on our gauge fixing, which means it's not gonna be physical. They had gauge fixing parameters all over the place. There's no way it would be a physical quantity. And then a grad student walks in named Pulitzer he says, oh, I'm working on the same thing. And they say, yeah, but it's not going to be gauge invariant. He says, well, I'll just see what I find. And what he found was a Nobel Prize because the gauge fixing parameters all canceled. And this is a problem as you get older. You have seen so many ideas crash and burn. You say, the likelihood of this is small. I don't want to waste my time on it. Okay. When you're young, everything looks exciting. You say, I don't care, this is what I'm here for, wasting my time, it's fun. Yeah? So it's important for me to keep on remembering to not be too worried about wasting my time because that's how you miss the interesting things because it's always the really new thing that looks like it's probably not gonna work. You just have to persevere and be willing to accept that 99% of your ideas are gonna crash and burn. Okay, um, that took longer than I expected, so I'm gonna skip some of the stuff I was gonna do. Um, 
I've got much more complete notes from a longer set of lectures, which uh, the notes are written up. They're on my home webpage, but I believe you're going to post them on the uh, Dirac lecture page. So uh, you'll be able to see all sorts of stuff that I'm missing. But what I want to get to is um, what are the outstanding problems in effective filtering in the last seven minutes, whatever. And those are the type of operators we have not discussed really, which are the relevant operators. Let's start by talking about one in QED, which is the electron mass. This is dimension three. The coupling has dimension plus one, so it's relevant. That tells you that the mass is more and more important as you go into the infrared. So if you're at LHC and uh, you see the electron whiz by at ultra relativistic energies, its mass is really not important for how it behaves. But um, you know, if you're playing baseball and get hit by a baseball, moving at non-relativistic speeds, the mass of the objects that are hitting you are really important. So that's a relevant operator. Now you might ask, well, what happens when I renormalize it? Well, first of all, I want to say there's something special about this operator, which is that um, I can write it as, and I can do a chiral projection right as left and right-handed fermions, sorry. So I don't have time to describe chirality, but you can talk about the electrons which are either um, spinning like a right-handed particle or a left-handed one, different helicities. Well, the kinetic term, does not couple left to right. It couples just left to left and right to right. And that's also true if you, if you gauge it and make these covariant derivatives. So if I didn't have the mass term, I'd have this extra symmetry where I could change psi left by a phase independently of psi right. So I could take psi left, goes to e to the i alpha psi left, and psi right goes to e to the i beta psi right. And that's a symmetry of these operators, the kinetic term, because they don't talk to each other. But it's broken by the mass term. So when I look at renormalization of the fermion mass, I want to look at an operator, say, where a left-handed fermion comes in and a right-handed fermion goes out, and there's some radius stuff going in. So let's put a photon loop. By dimension counting, we have a d4p in the loop. We have a 1 over p from the fermion propagator. We have a 1 over p squared from the photon propagator. And so this goes like lambda, you'd say. It's divergent. And then that would tell you that the quantum corrections want to change m to lambda, where lambda is your real cutoff on your nice finite theory that you put on the lattice, say. But that's not what happens because the photon does not couple left to right. It couples left to left and right to right. So if these two are going to join up, you have to put in an operator that connects them. And the only operator in the theory is the mass term. So you have to put a little insertion of the mass term here. So that gives you a mass outside, because the graph is proportional to m, and it gives you an extra propagator, an extra massless propagator. So now you have a 1 over p. And so it doesn't go like lambda, it goes like log lambda times m. So you're the change in your mass, your rate of correction goes like m log lambda. And this is called a multiplicative renormalization because the 
the change in the mass is proportional to the mass. So if the mass is small, yes, the log can be pretty big, but even if I take lambda to be the Planck scale, if this is lambda over m to make it dimensionless, even if lambda is the Planck scale, this log isn't huge. And there's an alpha over four pi out in front. And you find that alpha over four pi times log of m Planck over m electron is still less than one. So it tells you that the rate of correction to the mass is not big if um, compared to the mass. And so actually, this operator is no problem. This operator is fine. And so everybody's happy when they only see fermions. And until the Higgs was discovered, that's all we ever saw. Well, fermions and spin one particles. Spin one particles like the photon are protected by gauge invariants. They don't get a mass. So no problem. But now let's look what happens when you have a, a boson. Spin zero particle. Let's look at a, a charge spin, spin zero particle. So I, I put in gauge interactions. It could also have five fourth interactions, whatever. Now I look at the graph that will renormalize this, say, here's one. This, this interaction gives you two types of couplings with photons. It gives you this one and this one. So I've got a graph like that. And at order alpha, I also have a graph like that. This one has a derivative. If you do the power counting, these go like lambda squared. These renormalizations, they are not proportional to the mass of the scalar. So if you're going to do a computer simulation of this theory with some fixed cutoff and you want to look at low energy physics, uh, you may have put in a small m squared in your computer, but if you look at, uh, if there's a light particle in the infrared, the answer is no, because the quantum corrections made it really heavy. Well, you can fix that. You can fine tune your mass at the, at the, um, at the cutoff. You can say that m squared is m physical squared minus alpha over four pi lambda squared. And then this radiative correction would cancel this part off and I'd be left with something small. But you have to understand that you're gonna be doing a fine tuning of, your of the parameter you put in the computer. And the bigger lambda is, the greater that fine tuning has to be. If I want my cutoff to be in Planck and I want the Higgs mass to be 100 GeV, this fine tuning is enormous. It's 10 to the, what, 10 to the 30 or something. 10, 10 to the 40, I don't know. So it's something like that. So, this is sort of disgusting. It says that our real world looks like this incredibly fine-tuned theory. That, is, that sort of goes against this Copernican view that we're not supposed to be anything special, our universe is supposed to be generic. It's even worse for the vacuum energy. When I'm in curved space-time, I have to put a square root of g here where this is the metric. And so some, some mass to the fourth here, which is my vacuum energy, it's just a constant added to the Lagrangian, it couples to gravity, okay? And every single particle loop, like a scalar loop or a fermion loop with nothing external gives me m to the fourth is about equal to lambda to the fourth, where lambda is my cutoff. So again, the vacuum energy in any quantum theory you write down is naturally going to be at the scale of the cutoff. And yet, experimentally, when we look at the universe, the universe is big and it's not accelerating fast. We know that um, m, uh, this m here, uh, sorry, not that m, I've lost it. Yeah, this m here, the vacuum energy is about 10 to the minus 3 eV. That's obviously way below any possible cutoff that could apply to the real world, because we know physics all the way up to a TeV, and yet here's a cutoff on an incredibly uh, long distance scale. So it's a mystery. It's a fine-tuned universe. So um, a lot of the effort in the last 30 or 40 years in particle physics is trying to find out ways of fixing the cosmological constant problem or fixing the Higgs mass problem. And there's, I'll focus just for a moment on the cosmological constant problem before ending. And the only idea that has come about that seems to have any chance of working is a very unsettling one. 
And it is due to Weinberg again. He said, let's imagine we could have a universe where all different values of the cosmological constant could happen in different patches of the universe. So we imagine just huge fluctuations of the vacuum energy all over. And there's some probability distribution, which goes up for large m. Large m is far favored over small m. And our universe has to be right there. So it looks like it's incredibly improbable, right? But now you do inflation. Inflation just spreads these patches out. Sorry for going over, I'm almost done. And so now these patches with M M looks constant over distances of the size of our visible universe or much farther even. Still doesn't solve the problem about saying we have to be in a very special patch. But then he says, notice that in a, when you look at Einstein's equations, if you're in a patch with large M, you feel this very peculiar force. It looks like an inverse harmonic potential where everything feels uh, a linear force of repulsion between them, a gravitational force. So you and I would feel a linear force of repulsion that gets bigger the farther away we get. But it's F equals plus Kx, okay? And so the universe explodes, expands, okay? Now that's just a gravitational force. If we held on to two ends of a rope, we could stay together. The rope wouldn't uh, get, if it's rope strong enough, it wouldn't pull us apart. So, um, and this assumes that everything is uniform, uh, no big clumps of matter. If you try to make galaxies in a patch where there's too strong a cosmological constant, you find that the, the gas gets pulled apart before it can condense into stars, and you'd have no stars, no galaxies. So, in almost all of these cases, there's no galaxies, no stars, and therefore presumably no humans, or more generally, we'll be a little bit bold and say no life. It's hard to imagine life in this big, empty, cold space that happens after you've expanded exponentially fast. So the question now becomes, it's not that we live in a universe of the small cosmological constant, or not, it's not that this happens to be a universe of a small cosmological constant, it's that we are humans observing a small cosmological constant, okay? And if you look at the correlation between small cosmological constant and has humans observing it, it's very probable, because all this is zero, <laughs> no chance, okay? So now, one of the pillars of modern science that humans really should be taken out of the equation uh, is being questioned, and we, it's coming about because of desperation, because we do not see any resolution between effective field theory and our observed small cosmological constant. So you guys can see if there's another way out. Thank you. So do we have questions? We always try to encourage students to ask questions. So are there questions from, from the students? or from the more mature students? Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the, the Landau poll. And now this is based on perturbative uh, RG calculation. Are you ruling out the possibility of uh, non trivial distributions? Absolutely. So the perturbative calculation says that if you go up in scale, the coupling constant is blowing up. But once it hits one, our one loop calculation is no longer valid. This is the one loop calculation. Maybe it goes like this. That would be really interesting. Because then you just have to tune your lattice to this critical value. At any scale invariant, 
uh, short distance scale, and you automatically get uh, the hydrogen atom right, whatever, 137. So this now becomes a non-perturbative question, and people will look for it on the lattice. And as far as you can tell, this does not occur for QED. Just by five volts. Yes. So it becomes a computational question then. It's an excellent question. Any other quick questions? Because our guests are going to go and tour the Mac lab, but there are one quick question, please, by all means. I actually want to say one tiny little thing, please. which is a punchline which I missed, which is that uh, this theory has a prediction, which is that if you believe that the probability is rising, then it tells you that the most probable, probable place to be would be right here, right near the threshold. And Weinberg calculated that and found a number which is about 100 times bigger than our cosmological constant, but there have been more refined calculations that have brought that down. But the important thing is he was predicting a non-zero cosmological constant, and everybody at the time was sure his string theory was going to explain why the cosmological constant was exactly zero, and then in the 90s they discovered a non-zero cosmological constant. So this theory actually had consequences, and it was extremely unpopular when it came out. 